So more German Catholics in Louisville. So Germans, okay. In 1900, Louisville's population totaled 204,731, which included 13,263 Germans and about 35,000 persons who claimed at least one German-born parent. As the German immigrant population in the 19th century was assimilated, identifiable German customs and institutions began to fade. German neighborhoods such as Uptown, Phoenix Hill, Butchertown, and Germantown gradually changed as businesses encroached and the population moved to newer neighborhoods. Sermons at German Catholic churches and services at German Protestant churches began to be conducted in English rather than German Catholic parish schools that had previously taught solely in German began instruction in English. In 1914, as World War I engulfed Europe, American sympathies identified with the Allied cause. Courier Journal editor Henry Watterson, so again the Courier Journal, there's the Courier Journal again who you know, treated Gatewood the way they treated him, and also the Daily Journal, George Prentice, who is spreading out the anti-inflammatory uh, remarks against Germans and Irish Catholics. Again, the Courier Journal is, uh, uh, took a strong uh, stance against German Americans. So he was against, he, he had professed admiration of Germans and reversed himself to take a staunch anti-German position. As anti-German sediments, pervaded Louisville's culture. Many German institutions in Louisville changed names to downplay their German identity. For example, the German Security Bank became simply the Security Bank and the German Insurance Bank became the Liberty Insurance Bank. Also, German books were removed, removed from the Louisville Free Public Library and the city renamed many of its streets that had German names. As World War One, or as World War II approached, Many of the early German Catholic and evangelical churches located in inner city neighborhoods were in decline. Many closed after the war. The Louisville Anzinger, which had existed as a German language newspaper for 89 years, ceased publication on March 4, 1938. So there used to be 30 uh, German newspapers in Louisville uh, before the 1800s, and then now there's none. Louisville Anzinger closed in 1938 after 89 years. The Louisville Anzinger was the longest-running German-language newspaper. Among the thousands of Louisvillians who fought to defeat Nazi Germany in World War II, many were descendants of German immigrants to Louisville. Today, almost one in three persons in Jefferson County claims Germanic heritage. So even today, one out of three residents in Louisville are German. So when you're looking out here and you're seeing a bunch of white people, they ain't white. One-third of them are Germans, and they're trying to blend in with everybody else and everybody else. And if you see a German, you should call him out on it. Quit pretending like you're white. you German. <laughs> um, yeah, but one in three persons in Jefferson County claims Germanic heritage. The Germanic heritage of Louisville is preserved in a number of social, cultural, and civic organizations. The German American Club, Gesangverein, founded by German immigrants in 1878, is a social organization for recent German immigrants and those of Germanic heritage. The Gru Gruetli Helvetia Society, originally the Gruetli Benevolent Society, was founded by Swiss immigrants in 1850. The society operated the popular Swiss Hall from 1923 to 1993. The Kentuckiana Germanic Heritage Society, founded in 1991, seeks to promote awareness and preserve Louisville's Germanic heritage. Um, the city of Louisville began a civic and cultural association with Mainz, Germany. In 1977, the two cities officially became sister cities in 1994. So Louisville and Mainz, Germany are sister cities. So we have a sister city in Germany. Louisville does. Germantown, the Germantown neighborhood, bordered roughly by Goss Avenue, Baird Avenue, Bear, Cre Bear Grass Creek, Broadway, and the CSX Railroad tracks, was a popular settling spot in the 1850s for German Catholic immigrants. The land was once part of a thousand-acre grant to Colonel Arthur Campbell of Virginia, to reward his services during the Indian hostilities in the Northwest Territory. Campbell's daughter, Mary Beard, inherited part of the land in 1811, but found no purchasers for the swamp-laden property at the will's stipulated price of $20 per acre. She challenged her father's will and was able to subdivide and sell the land at cheaper rates to the newly arrived immigrants. The marshy condition of the Germans' new neighborhood, which spawned the nickname Frogtown, so... Frogtown, Germantown is called Frogtown because of the marshy uh, conditions. Uh, 
They isolated the residents and forced many of them to maintain their own vegetable gardens and bread ovens in their backyards just so that they could survive and eat. Other German immigrants became dairy farmers. The area experienced the largest growth in the late 19th century as the neighborhood became known for its candle making, butcher so shops, ice houses, brickyards, and a paper mill. In the early 20th century, the residents increasingly turned to blue collar labor and constructed the highest concentration of shotgun cottages in the city. Many of the cottages are camelbacks constructed with one story in front, two stories at the rear. Paris Town, to the northeast of Bear Grass Creek, settled by French Huguenots, once existed as a separate community. However, in 1907, a bridge was built over the creek to allow Catholics on the north side to attend church in Germantown. This led to the consolidation of the two communities, which culminated in the establishment of the German Paris Town Neighborhood Association in 1973. So that's uh, that's that's Germantown. And that's uh, that's all the the German stuff too. This uh one thing I just found here I thought would be mentioned I figured this is probably the, almost to the end of the uh, Louisville German Catholic series anyways it was a set of three and I'll probably end it off with some more uh, Catholicism I did uh, just German Catholicism is what I called it but it was mainly just Catholicism and whatever German stuff I was talking about at the time. Uh, but Quinn's Row in 1855, the riots that had happened, starting out of Butchertown, the 1855 Know Nothing riots, the uh, or the American riots, I guess you could say they're the American riots, right? Because they're the white Americans, they claim to be the true Americans, and they're like, we're the white Americans, we're the Puritans, we're the Protestants, Anglo, your uh, English people who are know the proper way, know how to act, know how to behave, and you Germans are speaking a different dialect, you guys are radicals, you want to change things. Your Sundays, you have festivities and picnics. Uh, you celebrate your Christmases. You celebrate your New Year's, but not like the, you know, the the white Americans in, uh, did not celebrate Christmas and New Year's. They did not have a continental Sunday. They were very quiet and they were very reserved. So, 1855, the riots had happened and they attacked Quinn's Row, which is an Irish, um, an Irish. Uh, part of town, Irish Catholics part of town, but I didn't realize how close it actually was, like to downtown. There's some of the streets are the same uh, names that we have streets of today. So they attacked Germans and Irish uh, in the same breath on the same day because the, the Irish are also speaking a different tongue. And the Irish are also racist, which is what one ger thing the Germans have over the Irish. The Irish, um, they're more, they were drunken and disorderly and they're more racist. I, I'm not hating on the Irish, uh, but the Germans, I'm having pride in my German heritage because they seem to be, they had engineers and scientists and they, uh, labor unions and, um, you know, a lot of uh, progressive work. They fought for the unions, they fought for uh, Lincoln, they fought against slavery, they fought for the women's right to vote, they fought against prohibition. William uh, Justice Goebel was the first German Kentuckian uh, New Dealer. In America, actually, he was the only person who got assassinated in America, which is what he's, uh, history is going to know him for, but he was not popular. Well, I mean, he was very popular in Kentucky, enough to get elected, but also very, he was polarizing. So he was well-loved and well-hated, and because of the forces that had hated him so much since, like, the monopolies, the railroad monopolies, they hired people to... Uh, they hired a militia to surround the Frankfurt, uh, to surround Frankfurt until eventually one of those people with a gun, you know, took their own uh, initiative. The Clay County and um, uh, Devil Bill Howard, Devil P Bill Howard out of Clay County is the one that shot William Justice Goble. So there's a there's a German Kentuckian who's a a martyr for the cause. So Quinn's Row was a block of houses and apartments just west of Louisville's downtown, occupied by Irish immigrants during the 1850s. It was named for an Irish immigrant, Francis Quinn, who, with his brother John, came to the United States in the 1830s. In Louisville, Francis became a merchant of small commodities. With the support of Francis, John prepared for the priesthood and was ordained in 1839. Father John Quinn, who served St. Louis Parish on 5th Street between Green, which is Liberty Street, and Walnut, which is Muhammad Ali Boulevard. So he served St. 
Lewis Parish on 5th Street between Green and Walnut, which is Liberty and Muhammad Ali Boulevard, was good at investing money in many of the immigrants and trusted him with their savings. So successful was the business that over the years he accumulated a fortune upon his death from cholera in 1852. Francis inherited the money and invested it in real estate. He acquired property and constructed apartments and houses on Main Street near 11th Street. He lived in one of the houses referred to as Quinn's Row and housing large numbers of Irish people. It had a short history. On Election Day, August 6, 1855, it became, which became known as Bloody Monday, a nativist mob attacked both Germans and Irish. In the frenzy, the mob turned its wrath on property and destroyed uh, Quinn's Row. So Quinn's Row is like a bunch of uh, constructed apartments and houses is on Main Street near 11th Street. So this is... This is more out west. So uh, he lived in one of those houses out in 11th Street on Main Street. Main in 11th. Uh, nativist mob attacked both Germans and Irish in a frenzy. The mob turned its wrath on property and destroyed Qu Quinn's Row between 7 and 8 o'clock at night. All houses in the, in the block were burned. Several residents were shot as they ran from the flaming buildings. According to newspaper accounts, a number of people died, including Francis. Like other victims of the tragedy, Quinn's heirs filed suit for compensation under an 1860 act that authorized the Louisville Council to compensate for property harmed by the Bloody Monday, uh, Bloody Monday riots. So I guess a lot of people had sued and got some money back. The property owned by Francis Quinn was valued at 34000 in 1855, and the heirs had sued for 20000 It's not clear why, but the claim was rejected by the Common Council in 1869. So it's kind of a sad end for the Irish there, the Quinn's, Quinn's Row. Um, and, you know, 22 definitely reported deaths, but Spalding, Bishop Spalding, he had said that uh, there were over 100 deaths in the 1855 riots, and I think that the the newspapers that inflamed, you know, the 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 anti-foreign sentiment, they wouldn't actually have told the truth of what they had done, what they had actually fanned the flames of. So I think that the media would have lied. I would not trust the media. The spoiling. I mean, I believe the bishop. I believe that the, um, the it would just be like lynching. I mean, it's not just like lynching. Lynching was worse. But with lynching, they would lie about it. They would either, some of it got reported. Sometimes there were, you know, uh, white people, white American Anglos were proud of the death and destruction that they had caused. And they would take a picture of it and send postcards to all their friends. But other times it would just happen and nobody would say anything at, at all. It was just swept under the carpet and nobody knew anything about it. Um, the, the person would just go missing and, you know, that was it. That was the end of that story. So I feel like that is more likely to have happened here. Um, against the Irish and the, the Germans. They killed 100 people, but they just want to keep it under wraps, so they tried to not actually get the fact that there was 100. Over 100 people were killed. They were burning people in the fires, and people were being consumed, and they were inside the houses. And they were being attacked in their businesses, their stores. They are you know, getting... Um, I mean, that many people died, so the specific incidents are uh, written out there. So the mother watched, you know, two sons, one of them die in a fire, and then one of them gets shot. Uh, and there's other stories like that, too, which I guess would be a, g a good ending if I <laughs> had those stories. Um, but, yeah, their stories are pretty bad. The, uh, the, I mean, it was a it was an anti-foreign riot. So just like the Mexicans, I think that that's how they were treated. Germans coming here speaking a different language. They had their own culture. They stayed off to themselves. Uh, they had a different religion. They had different, uh, you know, ethics and morals. They're all Christians, right? All of them are supposedly Christians, um, which is crazy how Christians seem to uh, want to attack other people who don't believe or look like them or talk like them. You know, Christians, right? Uh, the, the Protestants. The Protestants are, do not have a clean record when it comes to that. I guess the Catholic Church doesn't really either. But in this instance, in Louisville, uh, the Germans were uh, pro-labor, and they were for working class, and therefore the new immigrants starting a new life. There were social centers, and so they were uh, a vital part in this town in order for helping people to get up uh, so for their social uplift. Um, so the uh, here in Louisville, the Catholics uh, acted more civilized and brought a lot more 
to Louisville than the Protestants did, uh, especially in 1855, during the Bloody Monday Know-Nothing riots by the American Party, by the white Anglo-Saxon, Yankee, aristocratic, English, white American, nativist, racist, white supremacist, bigot assholes, bigoted assholes.